Welcome to our virtual iHeart Science Festival. Caroline is a postdoc, uh, postdoc in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. Today, she'll be sharing her talk titled, How a Mouse Makes Its Home. Let's welcome Caroline. Thank you, Javier, for the great introduction. Let me share my screen here. All right, hi, thanks for joining everyone. I'm very excited to share my research with you. Uh, I've been interested in animal behavior since I was a kid and particularly just observing what they do. Um, and animals do many cool things. And today we're gonna focus on building because animals can make really complicated things. Um, you've probably encountered something that an animal has made before while you've been exploring outside. For example, a spider's web, a chrysalis or cocoon maybe, maybe even a nest. So I'm so curious when I see these things, um, how do they make them? Because we kind of know why they might want one, right? If you're a small animal living in New England, it's pretty cold, you might need a shelter, say, to protect you from temperature if it gets too cold or if it gets too hot, and maybe also to protect you from things like predators. I work in the lab, um, Hopi Hoekstra's lab at Harvard, and we study a specific species of mouse. Um, so I'm gonna use them today as an example to address this question. How do animals know how to make complicated structures? And today, yes, that focused animal is going to be the deer mouse. Now, what is a deer mouse? Deer, mi deer mice, they are native to North and Central America. You might have seen one before. If you do see something that is mouse or rodent shaped, you can kind of ask yourself a couple things if you get a good enough view of it. Does it have a dark back and a light belly? Does it have a fuzzy tail? And does it have big eyes and big ears? Uh, you may wonder, do deer mice live around here, Cambridge, Somerville, Boston area? Uh, the answer is yes. I've actually even gotten a picture from a student who saw one hopping around in Central Square. So deer mice, uh, they live throughout North America. And North America has a bunch of different habitats, right? And us scientists, um, we very creatively have named mice that say live in a forest. We call them forest mice. Uh, mice that live on the beach, we call them beach mice. And here is a mouse that lives on an island, and you guessed it, we call them island mice. Now, deer mice that come from different locations, uh, they dig different types of shelters. They create these little, uh, these, these burrows for themselves. So here is a prairie mouse that lives in prairie, and they will dig a short tunnel that then connects to like a bulb structure where the animal will actually sleep, and we call that the nest chamber. And, um, and this is very typical for a dairy, for a prairie mouse. Uh, now a beach mouse, and if you go in, and um, observe them in the wild, we find that they will dig a burrow that has a very long entrance tunnel that leads to a nest chamber. And then there's even a second tunnel that comes off the nest chamber and approaches the surface. If you were to disturb this burrow, what you will often find is that the little beach mouse will pop out this other end, which will give it a head start on you as it escapes. And then uh, lastly, not all deer mice burrow. So here's an example, this is an exception to the rule. This animal lives in shrubs in California. And for some reason, we call it the California mouse. I didn't make the rules. Um, and this mouse actually doesn't burrow at all. So how do deer mice know how to dig a burrow? Are they say being taught? Does a parent deer mouse its offspring? Well, here's, um, here's how we actually uh, ask this question in the lab. First, we bring in deer mice and we start breeding them in the lab so that we get deer mice that are completely born and raised in the lab. So here's a deer mouse. Um, this is an example of a prairie mouse. And this mouse has lived in this cozy enclosure where it has food, water, and a nice bed um, all of its life. It's never seen, never seen a burrow. It's never watched burrowing. So the question is, does it burrow? And what does it look like? Well, um, how do we actually have mice burrow in the lab? 
we have uh, in the basement of um, BioLabs, so that's the, the building with the volleyball court, um, we actually have a bunch of these giant sandboxes that we fill with wet sand. I'm gonna give you an idea for scale. You tip one on its side, you can fit about six postdocs in there. Uh, and what we do is that we will put a mouse in there as food, as water, uh, but nothing else. If it wants a shelter, it must create itself. And we let it um, be for two days. And then after two days, we come back and we, uh, we want to see what it did. And we want to extract, we want to get the mouse out of there. And we then want to record if it dug anything. And let me show you how we do that. Okay, this video is gonna show you our process, um, but let me orient you first. Um, you'll see that here's the sand surface. There's been a beach mouse in here for two days. And um, let me remind you of uh, that escape behavior that beach mice have. You're about to see a researcher dip their hands down into the box with a tube. Um, a rubber tube, and we're just gonna use that rubber tube to disturb the burrow and the beach mouse inside. And so keep your eyes out for that beach mouse. All right, let's start the video. Here we go, here's the tube. And where's the mouse? Keep watching, oh, there it is. <laughs> and then it gets away. We will quickly lift it out, put it back into its cozy home. And now here's how we record what the mouse did. We come in with some expanding foam. It looks a lot like whipped cream. And we will fill the burrow with that foam. The foam, um, yes, it expands. It will, it will completely take up all the space that was the burrow. And then it's gonna harden. After it hardens, we can dig it out. And now we have a perfect, we have a record forever of what the mouse did. And so we can take this and we can uh, measure it, we can store it, and we can always go back to it, which is very useful as a scientist. All right, and it was so satisfying when you pull one out and it's like all in good shape, like so. All right. So as I said, the cast, they actually preserve the shape and size of the burrow. Here are some 3D scans of casts that we've gone before. Here is a typical prairie mouse burrow. There is that sock shape with a little tunnel and the nest chamber. We get some that are sort of more U-shaped because there are two tunnels. And occasionally we get one that has a bunch of branches. Now I'm just gonna um, quick, quickly pause the presentation for a second because I have some burrow casts to share here. So one second. So first I have for you here a typical prairie mouse burrow. So there's that entrance tunnel, that nest chamber, and then the scoop of whipped cream on top. That's where the foam exited the surface. So truly the burrow is from here down. So that's your prairie mouse burrow. All right, next, the beach mouse burrow. All right. Here we go, I have to lean back to actually get all into the shot. But here we have a much longer entrance tunnel, quite the master bedroom nest chamber. And then the skate tunnel that the mouse used to get out. So you can see that there's actually an entrance opening and an exit opening. Here's that prairie burrow cast again. And so in the um, attic, of the Museum of Comparative Zoology, but oh, sorry, the Museum of Natural History, there are stacks and stacks of these things. Okay, let me go back to the presentation now. So back to our little experiment, we took mice that were born and raised in the labs and we asked them to burrow. So what did they do? We found that the lab-raised prairie mice dug short burrows, entrance tunnel, nest chamber, um, beach mice dug a much longer burrow, and California mice, eh, they didn't do anything again. Uh, so what does this tell us? This tells us that the lab-raised mice behave very similarly to what the wild mice do. 
So this suggests that there's no teaching actually needed for an animal to know how to burrow. And this tells us further that burrow shape is inherited. Parent mice pass on burrow shape to their offspring. So one generation to the next passes on burrow shape. So you might look at this and wonder though, okay, well then how come if it seems like you get such a um, good blueprint copy from your parents, how is it that then different deer mice, um, so remember the forest mice, the prairie mice, the beach mice, how come they dig different shaped burrows though? And so what we think happened, why it is that different types of deer mice dig different burrow shapes, is that when deer mice first appeared in North America, uh, we think that they first appeared in a habitat and they dug a burrow in order to survive in it. But then over time, and we're talking millions of years, they started to spread elsewhere and um, into different habit other habitats now in North America. And so some of them might have spread into a similar habitat to their ancestors. And maybe the burrow shape that they inherited was just fine. But others uh, spread into more different habitats for which a, say, maybe a longer burrow was actually beneficial. So over time, the long, if you had a slightly longer burrow than your parents, just slightly, you maybe survive better. Um, and over time, those changes accrued. Um, well, well, those changes added up, and we end up getting um, now uh, current populations of deer mice that have substantially different shapes of burrows. Okay. So given what I've told you, I have a little bonus question for everyone, um, which is, all right, so we have these different populations of deer mice and we brought them into the lab. They're actually still pretty closely related. So we can actually um, breed together prairie mice and beach mice. They can actually have offspring. So what do you think happens when we let their offspring burrow? If a mouse with one prairie parent and one beach parent um, were to burrow, what do you think its burrow looks like? So I see that um, most people uh, chose uh, something between a prairie mouse burrow and a beach mouse burrow. All right, I think that is a totally reasonable thing. That's kind of like human height, right? Where it tends to be um, that if one parent, one parent is very tall, one might be shorter, you might, be, you might end up with something like average meeting height. Well, this is what we actually found in the lab. We found that these hybrid mice, so mice that have one prairie parent, one beach parent, they actually dig like a beach mouse. So in this case, burrow shape is kind of a different color where you might have one parent with dark hair, one parent with light hair, and most likely you also have darker or dark hair. So this is something that um, is just really fascinates us. Oh, sorry, that was my, my assistant, my assistant cat. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion from today, um, animals build complex structures and these structures help them survive. Uh, the blueprints from these structures are passed from generation to generation. We found that no teaching, for the, in the example of the deer mouse, no teaching was necessary. And lastly, over time, over many generations, these blueprints can gradually change. So that wraps up my talk for today. That's the end. Um, here are my image credits. Um, if you want to learn more about deer mice, I highly recommend going to our lab website. Um, so that's Hopi Hoaxers Lab at Harvard. And I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about deer mice, animal structures. Um, I'm look for, looking forward to seeing what you came up with. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, why don't we take some time and answer some questions? So somebody wants to know, why don't you just cut off the top part of the cast when you're getting the foam out? <laughs> that is a great question. And it is because I write notes on it. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> but I like to record the date and um, who helped. So for example, I usually put my initials and then if there were other um, students helping, I like to put them, uh, put their initials on there too, as well as identifying information for the animal. 
because as you'll see, the rest of the cast is completely encrusted in sand. It's very hard to write on. So that's why we keep them. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, someone else has an upbringing question. I know that you mentioned that the habitat definitely has an effect on the type of burrow and you know how they first kind of uh, turned out to be that way. But why does the prairie mouse burrow, why is the prairie mouse burrow, excuse me, so much smaller than the beach mouse overall? So we, we have a couple um, ideas as to why. Um, and one of them may be because the, the prairie mouse, relative to the mouse, the, uh, the plants in the prairie provide a lot of cover, right? So the mouse can go about, and then it's, it's usually, uh, it's protected from the view of say predators by just all the leaves and shrubbery that's around in the prairie. While the beach mouse, I've been to these beaches, uh, there's, barely anything. So the mouse feeds from little patches of plants that are spread across these big sand dunes. And then while it's traversing the sand dunes, it's completely exposed. So that is one reason why we think that that mouse really depends on a burrow to hide itself. And it will have multiple even little burrows among, along a dune system so that can kind of go from one to the other. Um, another reason is because um, we find that the, the temperature fluctuations you might think a beach sounds nice, but it can get really hot during the day and then quite cold at night. So we um, actually took some temperature and, and humidity probes and we sent them down the burrows at the beach. And we found that if you only dug a prairie mouse length burrow on the beach, you're feeling everything, all ups and downs. It'd be very cold, um, but once you get longer, when you have a deeper burrow, we found that if we looked at how the temperature changed throughout the day, where it cycled between like sun up and sun down, we found that it was nice and flat now. The mice were kind of living almost like your house if you, if you have something like central air and heating, right? Where it just kind of maintained a, a constant, comfortable for a mouse temperature. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Another question is, do you know of any examples of animals that learn to build structures rather than know how to build them innately? Hmm. Um, well, at least for rodents, I don't know of any examples. Um, well, humans <laughs> but I could, would be my first <laughs> go-to answer. But um, other than that, um, no, I think most, most animal structures are what we would call an innate behavior, a behavior for which no prior experience is necessary. Interesting. Uh, so another question is, if both parents are beach mice, could their burrow ever be shaped like a prairie mouse? It is, um, for, for any animal behavior, um, I would say like you always have some exceptions. And so for um, every, so I've tested hundreds of mice now, um, but for, you know, maybe one out of 50 beach mice in the lab, you might get one that gets you a little one, <laughs> gets you a little burrow. And then we do occasionally have a prairie mouse that does very heroically for a prairie mouse. Never quite a beach mouse, but a little bit longer than you expect. So I think it is possible. Interesting. Uh, another question we have is, you mentioned that on rare occasions, sometimes um, deer mice will build burrows with different branches. Have you ever tried, or do you know what would happen if um, a mouse had a parent from both of these mice that had these weird branches? We haven't um, done that experiment. I think it would be very interesting to take a very, so it would be more like um, uh, an artificial selection sort of sort of experiment where we take an animal um, that has a certain behavior, like a super branchy burrow, and we see whether or not we can get the, the um, next generations to inherit that. Um, it's a very interesting question. It's not something that we've done yet in the lab, um, but I, I do think that um, that would be cool to see. Nice. We have another question that asks, why are mice so tiny? <laughs> uh, well, I think, well, one, um, I will say that mice as a category is almost by definition sort of tiny. So what I mean by that is um, these deer mice 
are distantly related to house mice, which is the more typical lab mouse. Uh, the more typical mouse that if you're in your house and there is ma there's a mouse there, it's a house mouse. Um, and, but they're distantly related, um, like 25 million years. So kind of like between us and orangutans is like that sort of distance. And um, they're, the deer mice are actually more closely related to hamsters, actually. But um, once a, a rodent becomes a certain size, um, people like to call it a something rat. There's not a deer rat, but, <laughs> um, but, but when they're of a so small size, they tend to be called something mouse. Um, why they're so small, um, that I don't actually know. The California mouse, I didn't show this on my slide, but they're actually this big pretty sizable. Um, and I, yeah, I'm curious. I don't see that. I think I would really love to know <laughs> why it is that California mice are so big. Cause we also have to get them extra large cages in the lab. Uh, another question is how do the blueprints get passed down through generations? What is the biological mechanism there? So we, um, in the lab, one thing that we study is also the genes of these of these animals. So the genes are, are really like the inherited information that's passed on from, from parent to offspring. Um, so we believe that that's, that is what contains the burrowing information. Um, we find that um, a beach mouse has is 100% beach mouse, right? And then we had that hybrid mouse that was say 50% beach mouse, it still has enough of that genetic information to dig like a beach mouse. But then what about a mouse that's a quarter beach mouse? That, th that actually gets pretty interesting because then we find that as you slowly um, make a mouse less and less beach mouse, its burrow becomes less and less like beach mouses. So we really think it is connected to the genes. We don't know exactly which genes they are, but that's what we're trying to do in the lab. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is in the wild, how many mice live in a burrow and does every mouse have its own or do they share them with other mice? So the beach mice, um, we find that they tend to live in family units. And so uh, when we went out there to the beach, we, we gave the mice little tags and that way we could track which burrows that they were in. And we found that repeatedly family units, so parents, we found one, for example, that was what we think was a mom and like four sons. <laughs> We're all just sort of living together in, in, a, in a burrow. Um, for the prairie mice and forest mice, they tend to be a little bit more solitary, um, except during the winter. Uh, cold weather can then um, drive the mice to huddle together for warm such that you could track a single mouse and see that it, it will just pop around to different nests or trees, um, mostly on its own. Hmm. Uh, someone wants to know, are there mice living and burrowing in the tundra or the Arctic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, there are definitely, there's definitely voles up there, <laughs> which is another, um, which is kind of, they, they are also sort of in the same group as deer mice. But deer mice do um, have a range all the way up to, I think it's Alaska. Um, I'm not, i sorry, I don't know exactly where in Alaska. <laughs> um, so I, I can't tell you whether or not they're actually in the tundra, sorry. It's still pretty cold up in Alaska. Uh, how long does it take a deer mouse to make a burrow? One of, okay, the, the beach mice are perhaps the most efficient. I have plunked one in a sandbox, came back, and had dug a burrow yay long in half an hour. Oh, wow. So you have to consider the fact that this, this mouse is the size of about a chicken egg. It's about 13 grams, you know, soaking wet. And um, it had moved hundreds of grams of sand within half an hour. So, so no imagine for all those of you who shovel, shovel snow, that you wish you were a beach mouse because they just, it's easy for them. Thank you. Um, another question we have is other than the simple beach mouse and prairie mouse uh, type of burrow, do deer mice build any other types of burrows and do similar types of rodents have other types of burrows as well? 
So uh, for deer mice, it tends to be some variation on a single path. So there are other deer mice that dig longer burrows, but they just kind of go down and they stayed pointing down. Um, other variation, like we have some that just kind of make themselves little cups. So deer, for deer mice, their burrows are on the relatively straightforward side, but there are other rodents that do ooh, all sorts of things. So um, for example, um, mole rats will dig big networks of, of burrows because they mostly live underground and they use these networks to just access different roots that they want to eat and they can go to all of them without having to actually step onto the ground surface. Um, there is this, can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there is this um, ancient beaver <laughs> that digs a crazy spiral um, burrow and the reason why we know this is because nature casted it for us these beavers would make these burrows they would fill with like uh river mud and or okay, they would fill with mud and then that fossilized and so people um there are pictures of these online if you just look up like crazy beaver burrow fossil and it's just yeah this like giant it's almost like a looks like a spiral staircase so rodents there's a lot of burrow diversity Interesting. Uh, so we've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, a question we have is, how do you spot a mouse burrow in the wild? I would love to know how to do it better myself. <laughs> um, we tend to find burrows under um, little uh, groups, like little clumps of grass. Um, in, so in the beach, on the beach, we, that's how we, kind of, that was sort of a way for us to be like, oh, that's probably a mouse burrow. And then we would set up a camera and see whether or not we were right. And that was one of the better ways for us to find a mouse burrow. We think it's because that clump of grass provides some cover and might also, the, the roots might provide some structure. In the lab, um, we, we find that if we mimic a clump of grass, like we just put an object in a sandbox, mice will try to dig under. So that's a good way to be like, okay, my camera's here. Come on, mouse, do your thing. You put an object there, they'll sort of dig under it. And so we do think that um, if you can find a place in the, if you can find some, some place where there seems to be a little bit more vegetation, that could be a place to look. Interesting. Well, looks like that's all the time we have for questions for today. Thank you so much, Caroline. I really appreciate it. Thank you.